Welcome to Chemistry 111. This is our new chapter, Chapter 7. This is the little, in the, the way I used to teach a class, this would be one of the last chapters taught. But right now, this is where we, we, we draw the Lewis structures so that we can now take it from a two-dimensional drawing to a three-dimensional molecule. So we can fully understand what these structures would actually look like in real life. Now, why would that matter for some of you? Well, in biology, the, the concept of enzymes. You're basically looking at enzymes have that special key to lock mechanism where you have a pocket where a molecule is going to fit in there in just such a way that you can break a bond. You can separate that molecule and break it down into a smaller molecule. It's going to fit in based on the shape of the structure. So some of these molecules will react in certain ways because of the shape of the structure. And that's why we kind of need to know this. We, we're looking at dipole structures uh, at the very end of last chapter. Well, the very end, well, when we put this in a three dimensions, we can actually predict which side of this molecule is going to be attracted to what side of that molecule because of different poles. So that's where it's eventually going to go. But so this is some of the trickier, like, modeling issues. And I have models I can lend you if you need to actually make them and help you see these images. But worry about that when we get there. No. No. Sure. So the first thing we're going to teach you about is VESPER models. Ves VESPER stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. The basic idea, so we're going to take all of our electrons in our valence shell. We're going to put all these things as electron pairs. And the idea is that the molecule is going to be situated in such a way that all electron pairs are the maximum distance apart from each other because electrons are naturally repulsive to other electrons. So we're going to try to maximize the bond distance. And so all the molecules are going to be based on that. So the first thing we need to understand is the electron clouds. The electron clouds will take up a ton of space. It doesn't matter whether the electrons are in a bond or in a lone pair. We call those, remember, non-bonding lone pairs. They're going to be in an electronic region. And each region of electron density is called electron domain. So a domain, a domicile, the home of these electrons. And each of these domains will be maximum distance apart. So they're going to orient themselves in ways to reduce this propul repulsion to get the most stable structure. Now, in uh, earlier chemistry, like Chem 100, if you're doing a lab like this, we would blow up a bunch of balloons and twist them all together, and you would really see these electron domains, because if you put a bunch of inflated balloons, they're going to adopt these structures, because the balloons are going to push each other away. And so you can do this really easily with a lot of these simple structures. Now, a bond angle, we're going to look at the shapes and the bond angles. We're not going to care so much on the actual bond angles, but the bond angles are going to be there. And in the lab coming up, we'll actually like look at some of the bond angles. But I'm not really going to try to test you so much on that. But hopefully you know your geometry that there's 360 degrees in a circle. And so we're going to maximize these bond angles. The bond angle is the angle between two bonds. It's made of the triangle. 
So in order to minimize electron repulsion, we want to maximize the bond angle. So right here, we see some simple structures. We see a three balloons. You notice that the three balloons, instead of making a T-shape, it's going to make kind of a triangle shape, like a triforce over there. We're going to maximize, you would consider the bond angle there 120 degrees. It splits the circle three times. When we put four balloons together, it doesn't make a cross. It actually makes a pyramid, as you see. Because instead of 90 degrees, these, these structures actually make what we'll see in a minute as 109.5 degrees. As we put a fifth balloon in there, it, you got one at top, one at bottom, and then you make that triangle in the middle. And then finally, a sixth balloon, it's going to make an octahedron. You're going to have that shape. So we'll look at these more in a minute. But this is just an example of what you can do with just the balloons themselves. But, so this chart here is the basic molecular shapes. This chart will be given to you in the lab. It's part of a huge printout you'll have to print out, but it'll include some instructions and a bunch of handy charts, but this is a handy chart to have. We'll come back to this in a few minutes, but the basic shapes here are this basic geometry in the leftmost column. We see if we have two bonds, we would adopt a 180 degree bond angle and have a linear shape. So if we have two bonds coming from the center atom, if we had have three bonds coming from the center atom, we would adopt a tri trigonal planar. If we adopt four bonds, we get a 109.5, which is, becomes tetrahedral. Five bonds, we get what's called a trigonal bipyramidal. And six bonds would have all bonds be 90 degrees and would have what's called an octahedral. Before you panic and try to write down everything on here, we'll go through all these slowly and a little bit more in depth in a minute. I'm just showing the basic shapes here. You'll see here that not all the, uh, the, the, you could have two different shapes under this column. We could have what's called trigonal planar or we could have bent. You see in this drawing, we have E, which is our center element, and X, three elements around it. Or this guy, which is E, two Xs, and a lone pair. We have different names for different structures based on that. If we have four things around it and one lone pair, it's trigonal pyramidal. If we have two lone pairs, it becomes bent. When we have trigonal bipyramidal and we have one lone pair, it becomes sea saw or sawhorse. If we have two lone pairs, it becomes T-shape. And if we have three lone pairs, it becomes linear. And we'll talk about this. Then octahedral, if we remove one, it becomes square pyramidal, followed by square planar, followed by T-shape, followed by linear. So we have different possibilities based on how many elements. So what you would end up doing is you draw a Lewis structure. You would put lone pairs around it. You would connect it, make your most valid Lewis structure. And from there, we would end up looking at the shape. So we need to still use that Lewis structure ability. So if we can't draw a good Lewis structure, this is not going to help us one iota. So please be practicing your Lewis structures. I will help you. I'll be glad to help you. You come bug me, I will give you my time. So if you draw the molecular structure of water, you see water is H2O. There's two hydrogens coming off of the oxygen. 
you all CO2. There's two oxygens coming off the carbon. Why do these two different molecules have such a different structure? Why do they react so differently? Water dissolves everything. It's the molecule of life. CO2 is pretty inert. It's our waste product that we breathe out. Plants use it as a source of carbon, but we really don't need it. Well, all structures don't fit into those five basic geometries of linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. Because there's a difference between what we call a bonding domain and a non-bonding domain. What an actual bond is versus a lone pair. So the initial shape will always match the number of electron domains. So if we add up all the, essentially, pardon my, the shit coming off of the center atom, you're going to have that those five basic shapes, whether it's three single bonds, two single bonds and a lone pair, or even one single bond and two lone pairs, you're going to have a trigonal planar geometry. If we have five domains, that could be all five single bonds. It could be four bonds and one lone pair. Three bonds, two lone pairs, two bonds, three lone pairs. Be a little hard, but you could have one bond and four lone pairs. That'd be trigonal bipyramidal. That's going to be your basic shape. But so one of the things we're going to look at is the difference between electron geometry and what we're going to call molecular geometry. So electron geometry, it is literally what it says. We are looking at the geometry based only on the electrons. So we're going to count the electron domains and base our geometry on that. So to do this, we draw the most stable Lewis structure. We count the number of electron domains and, uh, and we're going to base that on. The number of electron domains will tell us the geometry. So two electron domains, it's linear. Three electron domains, trigonal planar. Four, tetrahedral. Five, trigonal bipyramidal. Six, octahedral. These shapes maximize the distance between electron domains. So I'm going to take a real quick break to just show this in action. Just show it. Now let's look. Why is CO2 different from water? If you draw CO2, we would have said, okay, C, O, O, single bond, single bond, put a bunch of lone pairs around oxygen, and then in order to satisfy the carbon, we would have double bond, double bond, let's see. Now looking at that, how many things are coming off the carbon? We have one, two. So that would have two electron domains. Now looking at water, you would have had a similar situation. You have O, H, H, and we put single bond, single bond, then we have a bunch of extra electrons, and we put lone pair, lone pair. So looking at that, we have one, two, three, four things coming off the, the oxygen. So with this in mind, we have two, sing, two bond, two bonding domains, two lone pairs, four electron domains. Why are these guys going to have completely different shapes? It's because we have four electron domains, so we draw water often as bent. And CO2 is going to be linear because we have a completely different number of electron domains. And so that's going to change a lot of their properties. And that's going to lead us directly into what we call molecular geometry. 
when we look at a molecule, we mostly see the atoms and the bonds. We don't actually see the electron domains. The electrons are there. They will play a part. But when we look at the atom, we usually look at the molecule, the nucleus, essentially. We look as the, like, the, the structure of what all elements are coming off. Since we don't actually see the lone pairs, we are going to base the geom molecular geometry just on the molecule itself, the atoms. The lone pairs will be there. The lone pairs will take up space. In fact, they'll take up more space than a normal bonded atom. But we'll still only see the molecule. The bond angle of a molecular geometry will always be smaller than the ideal bond angle due to the increased size. But when we look at this, I look at water. We're going to have a big lone pair cloud, two Mickey Mouse ears of a lone pair in here. The idealized bond angle of tetrahedral is 109 or 109.5. This actual bond angle will be actually less than 109.5 because these guys are big, fat, lone pairs, and it's going to push the, the, the bonds together. How much less than 109? It doesn't really matter. You could calculate it. There's ways to figure it out. We're not going to worry about that. I really... I teach the bond angle stuff, but I don't really test the bond angle stuff because it's getting very nitpicky. But we will look at the molecular geometry. So watch out for when a, a question asks, what is the electron geometry? What is the electron domain geometry? What is the electronic geometry? They're talking about electrons. When they say, what is the molecular geometry? We're talking about just what geometry does these three atoms make? We'd say it's bent because when we look at this, if we erase these guys off of it, we only see the, the bend. It's not straight. It's bent because of those lone pairs. So let's look at some examples of these guys. The next couple slides are just like this. Pretty straightforward. You don't need to memorize these guys, but we're looking at this. And I've drawn this is all drawn in like whatever crappy paint program I had. Just playing around with this. But essentially, our basic structure. Four I'm skipped three domains because three domains is pretty straightforward. But four domains. We're gonna see this a lot. Methane, CH4 is an example of four domain. Since there's four molecules. It's tetrahedral. Since it's all bonds, it's still tetrahedral. The electron geometry and the molecular geometry are the same. That is allowed. It's allowed for them to both be the same if they're all bonding and there's no lone pairs. Now, NH3. We draw NH3, you'd have free hydrogens coming off one lone pair. So there's still four electron domains. It's still tetrahedral. But because of one of those being a lone pair, it doesn't have a tetrahedral shape. It isn't a four-sided dice. It's like a squat triangular pyramid. Instead of Instead of a nice equilateral triangle, it becomes a squat pyramid. Essentially, instead of having a sharp pyramid, it's just got smushed in. And that's what it means to be trigonal pyramidal. Essentially, instead of the top atom being the center, uh, the top atom being the peak, the center atom becomes the peak. 
And then finally, water is the most common example of the bent domain. So we have four things coming off of it, still tetrahedral, but because two of them are lone pairs, they become bent. All these structures will be seen regularly or something similar to them. Now five, five, a little bit weirder. So trigonal bipyramidal. First, what does that even mean? Trigonal, the triangle. Pyramidal, it's a pyramid. So the bipyramidal means it's two triangular pyramids. Arranged like it is, it's a triangular pyramid on top and a triangular pyramid on bottom. You put them base to base and they fit together to make that trigonal bipyramidal. Basically, when we add that fourth atom from the tetrahedral, it pushes the three bottom atoms to the center. So we have one atom going straight up, one atom going straight down, and three at a, and, a, and a triangle around here. So the bond angle on in the plane is all 120. The bond angle up and down is 90 degrees from each of these guys. So it's a weird one. It's a weird one. But this guy we've seen. We did this structure uh, last lecture, I think. Or at least we did this structure in the last chapter. Phosphorus pentafluoride. Or phosphorus with five bonds to it. It uses all of its electrons to make the five bonds. It was an expanded octet. All of these structures will be expanded octet to have five domains. Because five domains, whether it's a bond or a lone pair, you add up, you're going to have 10 electrons. No matter what, you're going to have at least 10 electrons. When we look at the up and down atoms, we call those axial. When we look at the atoms on the plane, we call those equatorial. But okay, so when we remove the first atom, you technically have an option. Remove an axial or we remove an equatorial. We remove the up and down atom or in the, the triangle atom. And this has to do with the fact that the lone pairs take up more space. So you want to put them in the place that has the most space. So instead of removing them from the up and down, you're going to remove it from the equator. And so when we get that, we get the structure you see there. We call that a seesaw or sawhorse. If you turn this, so these are the two legs right here, right here, that's the, the balance beam of the seesaw, or that's the balance beam of the sawhorse. We have the two legs, and you can imagine this flipping left, right as a kid's toy. We have, that, we have, we have our two legs, and then we have our, our beam that's going to either go up and down as we sit on it. Example of that would be sulfur tetrafluoride. We remove a second atom. We remove a second atom from this the equator. We get what's called a T shape. It's just essentially a T on the side. You turn it around and you can see, yeah, it looks like a T stop. It's pretty clear, hopefully. You can see that T. Chlorine trifluoride. And if we remove a third atom, we go right back to linear because we still have the up and the down. We only see the up and the down on the molecular geometry. We could do that. It's not very common. Look at the structure I had to do. Krypton difluoride. What did I say about Krypton? Krypton's a noble gas. Krypton doesn't like to make bonds. So it, it's possible. It's not very stable. It takes a lot of energy to do that, but it's possible. 
krypton difluoride to make a linear. So it's not very common. And then octahedral. I've only included these three shapes because once we get past this third shape, it goes to T-shape and to linear again. So, and those aren't really common at all. So octahedral. So an octahedral is like the trigonal bipyramidal, except instead of a triangular pyramid, it's a square pyramid all the way around. It's a square pyramid up and a square pyramid down. But the thing of this is that isn't really shown in this picture is that this guy is perfectly uniform and always, if you rotate this, if you rotate this top point down to this spot, this spot down to there, and that up to there, and then up to there, you would get the exact same structure. This structure is perfectly uniform on all sides. You could rotate this all the way around. It's like an eight-sided dice. Essentially, everything, you could rotate this any different way and hold it in your hand, and it would be identical to the way you just had it. But So sulfur hexafluoride would be a common example of this. Many transition metal complexes. So there's whole fields of chemistry that deal with what stuff do metals make? What, what bonds do metals make? And metals make a lot of these octahedral complexes. We won't really have to worry about this, but this is a very common thing with metal chemistry. You remove one of those atoms, it doesn't matter which one. If it's perfectly uniform, it doesn't matter which one you remove. You will get a square pyramid. So what happens, you remove the bottom, suddenly we, we, we don't draw the pyramid on bottom, so it just becomes a square base, and it goes up to a peak. Now, because of we want to put the lone pairs as far away from each other as possible, when we remove the second atom, we want to remove it on the exact opposite side. So when we do that, it's just going to become a square, a flat square or square planar. There's a lot of D metal, transition metals that also make these. And these structures, these lone pairs like this, are in a lot of the different life chemistry that we have. We have essentially a square pyramidal type structure in hemoglobin, that the iron in hemoglobin is bound to that center of the heme molecule, and it has an empty spot of a top, a lone pair, that will interact with essentially the oxygen. The oxygen can bind up top. And this is the same general complex concept that we essentially will have these shapes where it's held on four sides and there's a space for oxygen to just attack the iron from the top and it binds there. Okay. Okay, let's see. So how would we determine molecular geometry? So it's just like with electron domain geometry, we're gonna start with a Lewis structure. All these guys will start with a Lewis structure. So we need to be at least comfortable with Lewis structures. We draw our Lewis structure, we choose this out. We're gonna determine our electron geometry based on the electron domain. Once we're there, then we start to differentiate between what is a lone pair and what is a bonded electron. And based on the number of lone pairs, we will, we will modify how we do this shape in order to maximize the distance. And that's gonna be our molecular geometry. And here's the tricky part that always gets people on tests. Remember, just because lone pairs aren't always stated doesn't mean they aren't there. You have to think of the valence electrons. So if I say on a test, what is the, what is the molecular geometry, or even what is the electron domain geometry of pH 
three, pH three. So how would we go about that? pH three. If I just gave you that and just gave you a multiple choice, multiple choice, what is the electron domain geometry? You might be wanting to say, well, there's three hydrogens. It's going to have some combination that has to do with three. But if we draw the Lewis structure, P, how many electrons should P have? P is in group 15, also known as 5A. So it means it has five valence electrons. So drawing this in, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So that's three valence electrons used. We have to put in the lone pair to give this guy an octet. So drawing the Lewis structure, pH three, kind of crummy, but it, it works. We're always gonna draw it crappy because it's a Lewis structure. We don't need to worry about making this pretty. If you want to go, what is the electron geometry? You have one, two, three, four. Put a little asterisk or a accent on the lone pair to differentiate. So electron geometry, it's gonna look like If I want to draw this just flat, we have a concept where we're going to start to use called wedges and dashes. When we add a wedge or a dash, the wedges and the dashes, the wedges and the dashes are going to help differentiate things being in the board coming out of the board or going or going into the board. Whenever we have a flat line on a structure, these guys are considered to be flat on the paper. So whenever we have just a line, we consider those guys flat. Whenever we draw a wedge, we consider those guys coming towards us, coming out of the paper. Whenever we have a dashed, dashed structure, we consider those to be going into the board, out of the structure. So essentially we have a situation where we have a flat hydrogen and a hydrogen coming towards us, hydrogen going away from us, and a lone pair going straight up. I could redraw it. I could redraw it on its side. It doesn't really matter. It will still be the same shape. I could redraw it like, I could redraw it with the lone pair being in the dash. It's loud. It's still the same shape. And when we start to look at the models and play around with the models, you'll be able to turn this structure. So you can rotate this to right there. You will be able to do this. Another way to represent that would be, this is a little bit weirder. But we could also represent it like guy doing the splits, arms out like a like cheerleader doing the cheer. But either way, the electron domain in geometry would be tetrahedral for this guy because there are four things coming off phosphorus. When we go to look at the actual molecular geometry, this guy now becomes, these guys are still here, but in now, now we focus only on this region. So we have three bonds one lone pair, and so it becomes trigonal pyramidal. We still note the lone pair, but now it's not just four things coming off of it, it's three bonds, 
one lone pair. And when we look at the lab sheet, that's one of the things we'll note. And I'll show you on the lab sheet in a little bit. But, so we're going to practice. Practice on these guys. So determine the molecular geometry of these guys. Xenon tetrafluoride and chlorine trifluoride. Xenon. The first thing first is to draw, is to do with the Lewis structure. And we have to follow all those steps. Keep in mind, on a test, you can have those steps in front of you. I didn't. That is the one major advantage of doing a online test. Is that, I'm saying, I didn't say anything about you can't use notes. I just said, Get it done in this time period. Zidon tetrafluoride. Read the questions, answer the questions. It's can you understand do you understand this? Can you apply this? Can you answer the questions? So xenon, that's gonna be a little harder. Xenon group 18, eight valence electrons. Seven from chlorine. There's four chlorines. That means that is 28. So that means 36 valence electrons. Though, thankfully, most of these structures will be pretty straightforward. Xenon, center atom. Put fluorine, 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 fluorine. That used up, well, eight electrons. So that, now we're down to what, 28? Did it? Two, six, eight. Each of these guys need an additional seven, two, three, four. No, each of these guys need an additional six. My bad. Two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two, three, four, five, six. Six times four is 24. We are down to four valence electrons left. So what is the rule? When we have added all of our electrons to the outer, the remaining electrons have to go to the center atom. So lone pair, lone pair. Lone pair, lone pair. We are done. These guys have octets. This guy has an expanded octet. Is it allowed to have an expanded octet? Well, yes. It is group, what, like five, something like that? Yes, it's allowed to. There's nothing we can do about it. We don't want to move bonds around. The important thing is all outer atoms have an octet. So that's our Lewis structure. From there, we need to go, how many things are coming off the xenon? One, two, three, four, five, six. So the basic structure is octahedral. The electronic structure is octahedral. The simplest structure is octahedral. We have six things coming off. If you're not familiar with that term, that is okay. We have xenon. We have two things coming in the front, two things going in the rear, one thing in the top, one thing in the bottom. Doesn't really matter what order I put them in, we're going to have five, six things coming off this structure. Now, the final question is, what is the, what is the molecular geometry of this structure? 
So based on that, what is the structure based on just the fluorines? So these lone pairs still there, still play a very valid part. The, yeah, it's still visible. Very valid part. So if I ignore these, these are still here, will still take up space. What shape does this xenon fluoride compound make? It makes up a flat square, so it is square planar. Our geometrical terms, it's a flat square, so it's a square plane. Chlorine, trifluoride, Cl, F3, seven from chlorine, seven from each of the three fluorides, so we have a total of 28. Chlorine, the center atom, put an F, three Fs. That uses up six electrons down to 22, six more all around to make fluorine happy. That's another 18, four electrons, lone pair, lone pair. Chlorine has an expanded octet. Is it allowed to have an expanded octet? Yes. So the structure is done. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. There's no way to make that happy. But chlorine trifluoride. So drawing that structure. There's five things coming off. So we have chlorine uh, top and the bottom. Wedge. So, I'm going to put the lone pair in a place where they're going to be farthest away from each other. So, they're right there in the, let's see if this, yeah, right there on the equator. These are going to be about 120 degrees apart, about 120 degrees apart. It's as far as it can get. So the electron geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, which is our basic one, two, three, four, five things coming off. One, two, three, four. Forgot to do that. Now, the actual question asks, what is the molecular geometry of this guy? If I'm ignoring that lone pair and that lone pair, what shape does this structure make? It makes our T drawn on its side It's RT. It's a T shape. I know. Very creative. We're chemists, not artists. But that is the process you'd have to do for some of these complex structures. So the more complex structures, and the, I'm not going to lie and say like, oh, chlorine trifluoride is a normal structure or easy structure. It takes a lot of different steps to go in there. That's like someone who's, this is new to them, that is like at least a five minute, 10 minute problem because you're doing Lewis structure, then you've got to think about the electron geometry, then you got to think of the molecular geometry to do that. But not all of them are going to be so difficult. Some of them are going to be your basic tetrahedral, which we've seen and we're going to get used to. No. Uh, I will, let's see. Yeah, there's that, there's that. 
So uh, I will finish with this slide and then I'll jump back a minute. Now it's possible to look at the geometry of a large molecule, but essentially what is the geometry of a large molecule? You just look at each atom in turn. Each atom is gonna have its own geometry. This structure right here is acetic acid, essentially vinegar. What you see here, this carbon atom, this gray carbon atom has what's called the tetrahedral shape. One, two, three, four things coming off of it. This carbon atom has the trigonal planar shape with one, two, three things coming off of it. This oxygen atom has the bat shape. Those little pink Mickey Mouse ears are the lone pairs. Where it just has, if you just look at the molecular geometry, it's just bent. Uh, this structure here is a, I'm trying to remember if it's tyrosine. It's a basic amino acid. But you see, this structure is bent. This structure is trigonal planar. This uh, structure is trigonal pyramidal tetrahedral, tetrahedral, and then all these guys are trigonal planar. You just see a lot of repetitions of the smaller molecular geometries over and over just in different locations. And all these guys add up to what the molecule would actually look like in a whole and actually fit. But So what would you do? You just look at each atom individually. This atom right here, for example, this carbon atom where my mouse is on, is tetrahedral. How do I know it's tetrahedral? Because you have one bond, two bonds, three bonds, four bonds. This carbon is also tetrahedral because it has one bond, two bond, three bonds, four bonds. So, I mean, even if you can't quite see the tetrahedron, you can look how much stuff is coming off of this and you can go, oh, four things, it's tetrahedral. But one thing that can help you as you determine these molecular geometries is going all the way back to that little chart that is available for the lab. Right here. This first column, this thing's steric number. The steric number is your electron domains. If you determine electron domains, it gives you right here in this basic geometry, what is your electron domain geometry? I say the chlorine trifluoride, uh, the chlorine trifluoride, yeah, had five things coming off of it. The electron domain was trigonal bipyramidal. Then this next step, which shows the number of lone pairs zero lone pairs, one lone pair, two lone pairs, three, four. You, if you count the number of lone pairs, it will tell you what is the molecular geometry. So since chlorine trifluoride had two lone pairs, it would be right here under T shape. And in fact, it tells you what is the expected bond angles. It shows you what it would actually look like. So having a copy of this little chart will be helpful as you work through them because I don't, just because I know all the shapes by heart, I don't expect you to know them. Um, this is the first time you've seen them probably. It's been a quick class. So the, the xenon tetrafluoride, there were six things coming off of it. So it's octahedral. It has two lone pairs, moving two over, you get the square planar geometry right there. So let that, this chart, be a guiding help as you work your way through this. So thank you for your time. See you on Wednesday.